Matter. My name is Ned Burwell. I'm your host and the founder of You Matter. I'm here today with my friend Jeff Roberts. Thanks for coming to, to tell your story today. Yes, Jeff is here to tell us his story about addiction and his recovery and what he's up to now. He's got quite an interesting story. He's an inspirational guy and I appreciate you coming on today to, to do this. Appreciate those words. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about what your story about addiction. Well, um, my addiction, it, it goes back a long way. Um, I, have a, I have a childhood trauma history, which um, I think my addiction started by me trying to cover that up. Sure. Um, I got locked in into an emotional lock of um, the man rules is what I call them is that uh, you don't we don't express emotions and men aren't intended to or aren't supposed to in society express emotions the same way a female does and I think with my trauma and with that mentality it was a uh, it was a, just a bad road to, and everything builds up like a melting pot and I ended up drowning that out or pushing that down with addiction okay with my substance of choice yes mm -hmm. and what was your substance of choice cocaine and alcohol cocaine and alcohol yes cocaine was <laughs> the the devil though in the in the two so yes sure yeah so what how deep did you get into this addiction like what and how did that affect your life Oh, it affected, and right off the hop, I'll, I'll, I'll say it doesn't just affect the addict's life, it, um, it affected everybody around me, mm -hmm. it affected my co-workers, it, um, like there's a, the, it, with the addiction, it, it, it's everybody, like it is everybody you know, knows your addiction, and, but you don't realize they know your addiction. Okay. Um, it affected me. Obviously, health-wise, it never really affected my job. I was fortunate that way, although it was my job that got me into rehab and that. But um, I never had any disciplinary issues. It was all life issues that got me, and, and to the point that I became suicidal. And it was um, it, just a dark, dark, dark road to go down. And so, if you just, uh, what was a typical day for you like? Like, would you get up in the morning and every day would you work? As you? you want it every day. As an addict, you, um, it's constant lying. Okay. It's constant deception. So I would want to go places, do things, and it was ultimately to get money or okay. okay. It was one of the two that I was looking for, right? So, any reason to get out of the house and buy something, get a little cash back and things like that, it gets constant deception, constant lying. That's how it totally works. And, mm -hmm. and you're, as long as I've known you, you're just, you seem like a person that has so much integrity and, and so that must have been, played its toll on you. It, absolutely. How does it be something you're not? I had a lot of, um, stigmas myself like uh, like uh, as the junkie the addict and, mm -hmm. and it took a long time three trips to rehab it took a long time to be able to say my name's Jeff Roberts and I'm an addict mm -hmm. and but that's what it is now and now I look at it and I am Jeff Roberts and I'm an addict and mm -hmm. and look it, it can it can get better and so at, at your worst point well what was your kind of wake-up call to, to realize that you know this was a problem? I think regularly being sad, like it's not a there's it's it's not a good place to be in. I was sad all the time. I you you your whole body gets a shell around it, mm -hmm. and you um, it's it's like you're just living within that cold shell and that's it like it's your you, you cut yourself off to everything and I think at my worst I was 
when I turned suicidal and uh, it was just self-destructive and I had no connections left. Like your only connection is cocaine. Mm -hmm. And so you, your friends were starting to kind of disappear right. one and, by one? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you just, like I said, it's a, you lose human connection and it's, it's all, it's become very selfish. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes um, like very self-serving, selfish. It's all, it's all just you, 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 and negative, negative, negative. There's no, there's no plus there. There's no benefit anymore. It becomes maintenance yeah. to just survive, and that's no fun. Yeah. And then, at what point did you did you sort of have the the wake up call, or or when did you decide to get help? Well, I went to, um, I got picked up in the woods in Ingersoll uh, by Jeff Ramakers. I don't know if I should say his name, but I just did. No, I think that's fine. I'll start. <laughs> I got picked up in the woods by uh, Jeff Ramakers, my EIP rep. Mm -hmm. And um, I sat in his truck and we chatted for a little bit. I was coming down and, <laughs> and um, it was just, I knew it was time. I knew it was... I had enough. And, sure. Mm -hmm. And so at, at that point, what, what happened? Tell me. Some time in the, uh, some time <laughs> in the hospital. I had to go to the hospital and you do that traditional 72 hour assessment and everything. Okay. I went through that and mm -hmm. basically that is a lot of downtime. It's a lot of sitting, right? So you do have time to, and uh, you have a momentary clean time to start thinking of things and you see yourself and you look around and see where you're at, and mm -hmm. I think I just knew I could see it breaking my family. I could see my wife, her her frustration and and her stress over it, and I think I just knew that either I would there's one way to go, and the other way there's one way to go to live basically. Yeah, yeah. that's now what what sort of feelings were you carrying in that? in that moment of awakening, like, was there a lot of guilt? Was there, like, what was going guilt on? Guilt and shame, <clears throat> both of those. And when I started to in investigate within me why, that's, it was more guilt and shame. Like, it was, it was just over piling on top of each other, right? And, mm -hmm. and like I said earlier, after 20 years of pushing emotions down, of hiding emotions, and manning up, and mm. after 20 years of that, your brain forgets how to do that. And I didn't know what I was supposed to feel. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know. I didn't understand what I was supposed to feel. Yeah. So I was kind of there in a hospital bed. What do I do here? Like what? I, I don't. I didn't know where my mind was, like, do I cry? Do I, do I get mad? Like, I, I had no idea what emotion to find, so it, I repressed it for so long. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's such a common thing with, with guys, is that we, we do suppress our feelings. Mm -hmm. The man rules, as I said, right? It's, yeah. yeah. And it's bred into us from day one, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fundamental uh, thing that I had to go through myself is getting in touch with <clears throat> more than one emotion. You know, I'd, I'd always just go to anger. Anger, yes. That's, <clears throat> is that was that? That, that was me strength? too, and that's the one I've always said. That's the one that's acceptable for men. Like men can get mad. It's aggression. It's mm -hmm. that's what we're supposed to do, right? And yeah, that's our one emotion that we're allowed to show. And mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's the wrong one to show. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what happened next when you, <laughs> <laughs> what happened next after you got out of the hospital? Well, then it, the process of figuring things out, going to rehab and I was, I knew I had to go and I wanted to go, I'd been before and I wanted to go to the right place this time because I knew there was something more to it in me than and memories were starting to come back and there was something more there. Mm -hmm. So Jeff found a place that, that dealt with men only and dealt with childhood trauma issues. Okay. And he took me to it. I was 
pretty apprehensive about it and he took me to it just to look and talk to a few people and then we drove home and he said have a few days and but I basically knew that was it felt right when I went there and I knew that was the place I mm -hmm. I needed to go to then it's a waiting list it takes 30 days three weeks something like that to get in mm -hmm. and I thought I can skip a, a detox portion of it because I could, I'll just stay clean. I'm not that bad. I'll just stay clean for that time. It was a matter of a day. I'm not clean anymore. So it, it showed me trying to literally trying to avoid a horrible situation. Detox isn't a fun place to be. Trying to avoid a horrible situation and I still went out and used and it showed me that I didn't know. I couldn't handle my life anymore. I wasn't handling it properly and I just I lost control of myself mm -hmm. and that, I, I think that's a fundamental thing that if somebody's struggling with addiction to know that they're not in control anymore in total loss of control <clears throat> the mind will put together things and say oh I got this yeah like, no. that's what that's what I heard you say and yeah then, and then within days you're, you're it doesn't take long and then I was told if I had five clean days I could avoid detox the day before I was supposed to go, I was using. So it was, mm -hmm. gotta go to detox. And sure, yeah. So after, so you went in, you detoxed, and then tell me a bit about the program. The program was fantastic. Still based off the 12 step program, which I struggled with because of the religious aspect. I'm not an overly religious person. Mm -hmm. And so I struggled with it in previous times in rehab. And, um, but this place used a different take on it okay. and um, the spirituality take on it. And they gave many different elements, many different options, and basically left it to you. They let you, they gave you a time to sit in the hammock out back and think about it for a while, right? And on a clean mind. And um, they also, there was a lot of uh, group therapy with other it was all men it was all trauma based with men so we got to hear each other's stories and it was maybe 20 guys and certainly one or two had a very similar story to what i had so it instantly there's a connection there's a bond there they've been there a little longer than i have and they're telling their stories so maybe i can tell mine now and Things quickly, like the place was set up very well, that things, it, you, you feel a freedom that you haven't felt any for a long, long time. And it was a great place for that. And yeah, it was just in the spirituality aspect. I, like I said, I struggled with um, religion. But after a while, I realized that's what I was struggling with religion. You don't need the organized side of it. And I, I found our friend Ralph Wolf Thistle. He was a volunteer. No, he wasn't a volunteer. He was paid, but he was there, and um, he said, "Come on outside." And he showed me some smudging practices and showed me a few other things. And we just started talking, and he kind of introduced me to the. You're just part of the world, right? You're part of the world, and that's we're all part of the the system, right? And I, I kind of found something in that and we found a bond and so he's kind of my my spiritual godfather now. <laughs> and, sure, yeah. And yeah, and it's just, uh, it just worked out. I think I was in the right place at the exact right time and mm -hmm. the right people met. And yeah. And I, I, I personally would believe that the spiritual component would be important, not the religious one per se, but okay. Unless you were religious, and, and that's fine too. Mm -hmm. But um, the spiritual component kind of hooks you into more support, mm -hmm. and, and whether it be through just that, that what we feel through smudging and, mm -hmm. and through the native traditions or whatever, I just I think there's something to be said about that. I remember one of the things Ralph taught me, and I really liked, is we, I was struggling with meditation. We meditated. I was struggling with it, and we went out and we sat down beside a tree and he says, all you got to do is just be like that tree. Oh. He says, what's it doing? It's being quiet. It's sitting there. It's just enjoying the outside. He says, do exactly what the tree is doing. Mm -hmm. And it was something so simple, yeah. but for a mind that's been clouded for 20 years, mm -hmm. it worked. It, it 
needed something that simple. Yeah. What a what a wonderful way to frame that. Mm -hmm. Like that. So after you um, got out of rehab, how how has your life changed? Uh, changed in a big way. A lot. I've I've met so many people, and I've um, I started going to meetings. It's the 12 step program, you go to AA or NA meetings, and I started doing that, but it didn't fit for me. I didn't feel right in those situations, and, but I kept at it for a little while. And then I, I, I researched the whole 12 step program a little more and why do they get you to go to meetings? And it was to, it was to keep you involved in the community in that. And so I thought, well, I certainly I can be involved in the community without having to go on these uncomfortable meetings. It just weren't for me. There were a lot of people that worked for it. Mm -hmm. But so I just got involved in other ways. I, I took some, actually through you, I took the assist course through your recommendation and uh, mm -hmm. for suicide prevention. And I got engaged in the mental health community a little bit and mm -hmm. more of the addiction community a little bit. And I just did it my way, sort of. But it, it had the same principle as the 12-step program. I stayed involved in the community. And, I, that was key, I think, and I'm still doing that today. I blog now and mm -hmm. just try to keep engaged, and mm -hmm. it keeps it fresh on your mind, and and you can help somebody, which feels good in the end of the day. And, and what do you see yourself doing down the road? You know, I it, once again in the twelve step program, it's one day at a time. So, <laughs> sure. so my uh, down the road. I just want to. I just want to do the right thing. That's why I blog. That's why I, I try to keep in touch with people. Like now, a lot of people, because I'm very open about my addiction and childhood trauma. People come to me now. I've found that they, they maybe they want a piece of what I got, right? And a lot of people come to me, and I'm so happy about it. It it it, it makes me feel wanted. It makes me feel needed, and even if it's only one in a hundred, when you see somebody come out of a mess like I was in, mm -hmm. because they originally came to you, it's a powerful feeling and it, it feels good and it makes you want to do it for another 10 years and like it's, it, it makes you want to do it forever. It's true, yeah. yeah so it's, it's all, it's all 100% engagement. Stay engaged, stay thinking and mm -hmm. yeah, we, we have powerful minds for a reason, right? And, That's right. Yeah. Help people. So, what do you, what would you tell somebody who's, you know, back if they're in in their addiction? What would you say to them? If somebody in the depths of their addiction, it's not so much what I'd say to them. It's that I'd sit and listen to them. That's what somebody who, somebody who's in the the heart of their addiction, they they need someone to listen to them and compassionately, and with empathy and they need somebody who doesn't necessarily understand them but is willing to try to understand them. As long as you're willing to try to understand them and try to see it from their side, they might not be right but their problem's bigger and that's not whether they're right or wrong. They need somebody to just listen and that's the biggest thing I've found. That's what it was with me. I sat with Jeff Ramakers for several times for hours with tears in my eyes and coming down and he listened, he sat and listened, and he didn't judge, and that's what helped me. And mm -hmm. So anyone who contacts me, I, I, I'm open to just listening to them and not judging them. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really good information to share with anybody that watches mm -hmm. this video. To, if you know someone who's struggling with addiction, open up a dialogue. Yeah, just listen and be honest and, and don't, like, uh, an addict is a, is a chronic liar and is a chronic deceiver and you will not be able to bullshit them. Listen to them and be honest with them. If you bullshit them, uh, an addict, they don't, their minds are cloudy, but they know what's, they know you can't bullshit a bullshitter, right? Yeah. And they're on to that and you got to listen and be honest and that's, and it will help. I can guarantee it will help. In, in sort of what what are some of the mindsets that you now embrace that you couldn't embrace before? Emotion mm -hmm. and being able to uh, 
before I had guilt and shame, childhood trauma, it wasn't a good situation. And back then, in my mind, it was an embarrassing situation. And now I realize it wasn't my situation. It was the predator situation. I just happened to be the person. I was the victim. Now I can say that and realize I have no reason for guilt and shame. I'm, I, I am who I am, and that is just that's just one thing that happened to me. Mm -hmm. I'm still me. There's still a million other good things that happened to me. That's just one bad thing that happened to me, and I can't let that define me. Mm -hmm. What a what a great point to make. And I, I recently interviewed a person and, and she had came to that same conclusion. And I, I think that's a powerful place to be. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. You know, where you, you are no longer the victim of that. You, it just, it happened to you, but that's not who you are. Right, it's something that's unfortunate. It's something that happened to me. It's not my fault, mm -hmm. it's somebody else's fault. I happen to be at the wrong spot. And the wrong time, the wrong, it's just, it's just an unfortunate thing, but it was no choice of mine. So why should I feel shame? Why should I feel guilt? Mm -hmm. It's, and now I can openly cry about it. I can openly, I, I tell people I'm a victim of childhood trauma. It doesn't bother me to say that anymore, where I would never even admit it to myself before. Sure. Yeah, yeah that's great. Any, anything that you want to tell uh, people that you, know, you already come up with a great piece of advice for someone how to help people with addictions? Is there anything else that you want to say to... Be open. There's no point in... I would say I've never... In, in addiction, I never helped anyone. And I was pushing things down. Now I'm... I think occasionally I help somebody. They come to me, so... And I think I do often now help people and they, they come to me for advice and they, they come to me, what do I do? I'm in a crisis. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that I couldn't do while I was pushing emotion down. So being open opens you up to helping people. It opens, it opens the door. When they see you're open, they see honesty and they'll come to that door. Yeah, yeah that's great. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Okay, yeah, I hope it. Yeah. To, for people to see yeah. this. Okay. Thank you for watching, and we appreciate all the support from the, the community of people that watch and support mm -hmm. our, our You Matter project. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, yeah. Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>